ladies and ghouls, this is Ryan Sierra. We are going to play Pears. Pears is a visual novel that I actually um, am a little nostalgic about. Um, make your critiques. I wouldn't say it's the greatest masterpiece on this earth, but um, when I first played it, and then when I played it again, and now as I play it right before you all, uh, it has always been so emotionally impressionable on me, and I am ready. Space, the final frontier. For them, that is. Alone in the galaxy with no other life forms for light years, planet Earth was once a sitting duck waiting to be conquered. Perhaps in another world it would have been if it hadn't been for them. The naturals, humans with abilities beyond the imagination, appearing just in time to save the world. The first time the Earth clashed against the Nyans was devastating, but for the blood, sweat, and tears of the naturals, that first battle was won. Humanity's appetite whet, they began to prepare for all-out war against Earth's invaders. Just three generations have passed since that first mighty clash, but the legacy those mighty first-generation naturals, and their war against the Nyans lives on. And uh, I, uh, Ryan, am uh, thinking maybe the music is just a little bit loud, but whatever. Return, return. <laughs> it's like I, it's like I can't read English sometimes. Anyway, hey everybody, what's going on? This is Ryan Sierra. Uh, you won Max's severed head, and I'm playing Pears. Pears is one of those visual novels that like. I guess to, to sort of put it in a quick, slapdash, shorthanded way, um, it's it's a visual novel that came out during that time of a sort of niche where a lot of visual novels were oddly homoerotic and also really into like mecha and outer space shit, like Gundam or like Voltron or something. So like, and I really like that era of visual novels personally myself. Um, among many other sort of, you know, niche eras of visual novels, um, without further ado. In the city of Q is where it all began. Ah oh, shit, QAnon, oh no! The creation of the World Protector Program, WPP. <laughs> Instead of www. Dot, it's WPP. Dot. Huh? Yeah, funny, funny. Around the clock, it prepares the next generation of naturals, eagerly waiting for their chance to go head to head with the universe's greatest threat, exoplanetary dictator King Chaos. And of those scores of heroes, not one of them would ever dream that the successor of their greatest threat is down on Rosemary Boulevard in a pastry shop. She kicks open the door with impunity, a defiant sneer on her face. Nobody move or I'll turn your skin inside out, okay? Kitten Pink, daughter of King Chaos, terror of the U Golly, this music is still so loud. Okay, here we go. Kitten Pink, daughter of King Chaos, terror of the universe and heir to the throne. A slender baton bounces lightly against her thigh as she strolls to the pastry counter. Her fingers drum against the weapon almost impatiently, daring someone to challenge her. She's there for one reason and one reason only. Except you, cutie. You can come with me. I'll even let you keep your skin on. James Zhang. The cutie looks up from his magazine. He looks unperturbed, almost too accustomed to her villainous entrance. And he ignores her. I feel like we talked about this. About what? You know, making empty threats when you're coming to see me at work. Empty? To be quite honest, she doesn't know what an empty threat is. If she's saying she's going to take all of the black diamonds in the world because she feels like it, then she does. If she tells her father she wants the left pinky toe from the citizens of every town that starts with the letter F, then he'll have a gift-wrapped box waiting for her in her ship within the week. And if she threatens to turn a man inside out, James understands what she means. It's one of the reasons she likes him, after all. Well... Empty or not, I told you before that one of these days you're going to get me fired. You should be more careful when you come to Earth. It's just your luck that no one else is in the shop anyway. Kitten slaps her baton out of her belt loop, twirling it absentmindedly. More like, just there. 
She trails off, glancing down distractedly at the dessert cake. That tiger cake cup! It has such a glorious coloring! Of course, they do appreciate its natural form, but I just love how... how... The young man at the counter tries his best not to laugh at her reaction. Pink it is. Pink it is. I made these cupcakes this morning. Do you want one? Will it turn me into one of those creatures if I eat it? Not even slightly. Her shoulders droop. The only thing that rivals her love for the wails of her defeated enemies is a total adoration for all things pink and, more recently, Earth's cats, large and small. But even her cute exterior cannot hide the bloodthirsty interior of a Nyan warrior. Supposedly. She looks back at him, refusing to be distracted. Then I decline. You should improve on your Earth science. Right. I just came to confirm that we're still on for tonight. You promised, you know. James pauses. James pauses. Yeah, I did. I'll see you when we close. I'll see you when we're close. No, it's when we close. <laughs> Time to sip from the sip bottle of shame. Mm. <sighs> That's good, good shame. <laughs> Those pastries over there look pretty cool, honestly. Oh, and there's some over here. We have a dual... What the fuck is this? You have a dual pastry shop? What is that? Whoa! She considers hugging... She considers hugging him then and there, but she might accidentally stab him, and she doesn't really want to do that. She settles with cheering, her fist clenched in exhilaration. All right. Instead of his usual look of surprise when she expresses any kind of joy, he smiles slightly, seeming amused. She hums lightly as she looks at the rest of the strange earth sweets. Maybe for the first time there is someone on the earth whom she would mind if her father obliterated. Someone whose heart she's determined to capture, even if it means she has to rip it from his body, forcefully. If someone asked James Zhang what he thought he'd be doing with his life by age 25, he would have guessed chemistry major. Or maybe he would mumble something about interning at his dad's law firm because, once upon a time, his dad wanted him to be a lawyer just that badly. It's even possible that he'd have started shopping for his first apartment, arguing over potential furniture with his mom. He definitely would not have said, Oh, 25? I'll be working in a pastry shop, living paycheck to paycheck while raising my little sister. And yet that is precisely where he is and precisely what he is doing. What up, Gen Zers? How's it going? This one's for you. I'm a Zillennial myself, so I'm also in the thick of this shit. In reality, he doesn't mind it half as much as he thought he would. He misses his parents, true, but most of the time he's so busy taking care of May that he doesn't have the time to think about them nearly as much as he used to. His phone buzzes with a text. May? Hey, James, can I go over to Venus' house? Unfortunately, today isn't one of those times. He wishes that he could somehow summon his parents from their graves and ask them for help. He wishes they could make the adult decisions for him. What if his sister got hurt? What if she got caught up in some crazy battle and couldn't find cover? What if she didn't make it back? James sighs as he stares at the text. Yeah, that's fine. Text on arrival? He deletes the tour he deletes the words and starts over. <laughs> Time for a sip of shame. <sighs> Still too serious. He adds a joke, then presses send. If you need a hot guy to make it interesting, let me know. I'll be right over. Ha! Better! How? Her response is an instantaneous thumbs-up emoji. It's so casual that his anxious thoughts seem almost comical in comparison. His phone buzzes with a follow-up message from May. I don't know about needing hot guys, but if we need hot air, I'll let you know. You seem to be full of that, after all. James grins. Puberty makes May so snarky when she wants to be. He lets out a light sigh, slipping his phone back in his pocket. This really is not the life he imagined for himself. And now, to top it all off, somehow he's managed to get himself tangled with someone whose father has the power to destroy the whole universe and then glue it back together, atom by atom. Uh, he's literally fucking dating Gamora and, like, the Nebula. What the hell? Which is precisely why he'd agree to date her. He's doing his best, but May needs real parents. Their parents. And if dating an alien princess who just might vaporize him if he catches her in a bad day is the way to do it, he's willing to take his chances. 
To say he hates her is a stretch, but lately, he feels like it's been a little more than that. Like he doesn't really mind her, either. She certainly is a whirlwind, even when she's threatening his livelihood. What would his parents think of her? Because that would have gone over well. Mom, Dad, this is my girlfriend. She may or may not collapse buildings as a hobby, but she's a nice girl most of the time. Her moral compass is just a bit... Just a bit shamey and sippy. Mmm! Mmm! A fitting metaphor for her, he thought at the time, and not too surprising that she and the flower shared the same name. Noya. The voice of his co-worker breaks his thoughts. Hey, what are you smiling about? Hmm? I'm smiling? He shakes his head. What is he thinking? This, whatever it was, is definitely temporary. Just until he can get his parents back. No matter how cute he found her at times. Wait, what? Wait, what? Wait, what? Carmelita rests on her hands and knees, breathing hard into the ground. Do you want to spar again, dragon? Do you want to spar again, dragon? Dragon. A word that evokes fear and wonder. Mystique and mystery, shining scales and pearly claws, a ravishing hunger for gold. Sometimes intelligence, sometimes more reptilian beasts, mere reptilian beasts. It's not her real name, but everyone got a tag when they joined. The moment Carmelita was assigned to Team K, she became Dragon. It's a name that reminds her to be strong and makes her think of home, of proud parents who loved her and fought against their desire to keep her home and safe from harm. She looks up and finds the strength to stand. Her body tells her not to. Creaking and cracking with bruises yet unborn. Bruises yet unborn! But even her exhaustion can't take away from the burning in her chest which yearns to fight again and again, even if she knows she will lose. Hand-to-hand -hand combat has never been her strong suit. Not only are her powers still developing, but they are hardly made for going on the offensive. No. What pushes her on the... What pushes her on is the knowledge that she can't stay a trainee forever. She stands up on battered knees and prepares to fight. Let's take it from the top. Are you sure? You seem a little tired. Why don't we fight doubles instead? It's the best thing her teammate could have possibly said. Carmelita eyes, Carmelita's eyes wander to the sidelines where the other members of the team are watching. Her eyes meet the ones she's looking for. Dibs on... Glamour. We know. She flashes him an excited smile. Ricardo Fernandez. His tag? Glamour. He winks at her, an illusion of glitter appearing the moment his eyes close. No flirting. Ha ha ha! Get that flirting, guess what, you know? Because he was just so handsome, it's just automatically flirting. Flirting? Rather than flirting, it's more like... That's how he usually is, isn't it? Charming. She looks at Glamour, expecting him to look as surprised as she feels, but instead, he eyes her with a lingering glance, his lips parting into a lazy half-smile. Monitoring the match, the team counselor lets them know that the match is about to start. Positions, please. Positions for Valheim. Carmelita marches to the start zone, but can't help glancing at Glamour again. You were flirting? With me? His eyes slide over to hers to make eye contact. There wasn't anyone else I had in mind, no, but... Wait, we gotta give him a real- a, a good voice. What are we- what are you doing? You gotta be like... There wasn't anyone else I had in mind, no, but... He eyes her coolly, and she isn't sure whether or not the glow she sees around his face is an illusion. If you have to ask, I'll have to try harder. Carmelita stares at him, wondering what to say. Lately, it seems like she never knows what to say, especially when he starts acting like that. He looks away, taking his position. Before she has time to form a response, the match starts with a blow of the whistle. There is nothing as calming as his black box. To spin illusions is hard work. It takes a special form of concentration to take a person, wrap them in colored strings that only he could see, and transform them into someone else, concealing their true form from the outside world. He has to believe a lie enough that it becomes the truth, and the stronger the true image of a person is to him, the harder it is to keep up their glamour. Secretly inside, he struggles every time he changes Dragon, hides her gleaming scales, and slips her into human skins born of his imagination. Except for one thing. Her eyes. 
He never touches her eyes. Some say they are unsettling, but he has always admired them, even when he was a child. As an illusionist, it has always been easy to see through his own illusions, so when he thinks about the glamours he spins for Dragon, he can't help but feel a strange sense of pride. Somehow, knowing that he is one of the few who gets to see her true face is a cherished secret, at least to him. He thinks of the time when they first met. Honestly, he barely remembers it. He can only imagine holding his mother's hand, hiding behind her while Dragon rushed up and squeezed him into a hug. So you're my new best friend, she said. He's never been the fearful one. It's always been him. Even now, he insists he stay glamoured when not with their team. What would happen if someone mistook her for one of them? The Nyans are now notoriously bloodthirsty enough that many younger, inexperienced trainees have an act-first, question-later policy. And Dragon's powers aren't strong enough to protect her, not yet. Carmelita. Hmm? Her voice is comforting. He opens his eyes, and his illusion of the void disappears. In his dorm room, he sits quietly on his bed, reading. Unglamored, so beautiful, and no one else could see it. He'd promised her parents that he would make sure that no one ever troubled Carmelita over her appearance, but sometimes he wonders if it's too much of a burden. He remembers the way her parents looked whenever the doorbell rang, the way she wasn't allowed past the high brick walls of her family's property as a child. He could never do that to her. Instead, he could only be thankful that his powers manifested when they did, because his illusions were the key to her freedom from their protection. He would never tell her that, though. He would never. I was thinking, we should go see your parents this weekend. Carmelita sits up, wide-eyed. Moments like these make him feel closer to her, mainly because, the moment their eyes meet, he knows exactly what she's thinking, and that it matches his thoughts, too. You want to tell them? About us? He answers the unspoken question. I think we should. She's quiet as she flops back down on the bed and stares at the ceiling. She puts the book on her face, and it's not hard for him to imagine her grinning behind it. I... I'll go file some requests for leave, then. She still loves them, her parents. Bro, you won the prize way interstellar! Aw, oh, shit! But that's okay with him. Even if she never knew, he would always be sure that she could be free, even if it killed him. In a world of supernatural... Oh, do we finally get to pick the story we really want to follow here? Oh, man. What what a trouble. Um I kinda like James's story, so we'll go with we'll go with him, right? Ricardo's is fascinatingly complicated. But we'll go with James for now. James, you keep turning off your alarm. Just get up already. My sister's voice cutting through my bizarre dreams. I sit up with a start. It's seven AM. Counting on my fingers, I do some quick calculations. Drop me off at school by 7.15, be at the shop by 7.30, get to work in time to finish the raspberry lemon tort garnish, layer the sea salt caramel banana pudding, and thumbprints at... I trail off, giving up. I was supposed to be at work an hour ago, and I'm just waking up now, so there's no way I'll be on time. I run out of fingers before I run out of tasks to tack on the ever-growing list of things I need to do today. I try not to sigh. At least I can guarantee that May won't be late for school. Not today, anyway. Pushing myself back from my chair, I hear something land on the ground. It's May's jacket. Tumbling from its previous position around my shoulders, I scoop it up and toss it onto the bed. I have got to stop falling asleep here. After the fastest shower of my life, I brush my teeth and get dressed. Tossing- Wait, 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 where, where does he fall asleep? What does that mean? I'm in the car. Your lunch is in the kitchen on the table. Thanks, May. Throwing my jacket on, I rush out the door. The shop is still dark when I walk in. The display case is empty. Hannah, my co-worker, looks up at the moment I walk in, then gets back to her work. You know, for someone who's somehow managed to convince my mom that they'll be okay watching the shop alone for the next two months, you're doing a pretty terrible job. She tosses my apron at me, landing it squarely on my face. You're late. Yep. Anna grimaces. And boy... Ha! How many cookies do we need? Nine dozen. We got in a huge last-minute delivery order for Solomon Kumalo. I would have loved to have another assistant baker here for, oh, I don't know, assisting, but somehow I opened the shop to discover that I was all alone. Again. 
I wash my hands, strapping on my apron. No point in making up excuses now. Let me guess, taking May to school? Yep. You should seriously consider getting her a car. Sounds like you want to pay for it. How much are you getting paid again? Not enough for the amount I cover when you're late. Touché. She glances my way, and sure enough, there's the glare that she was holding back earlier. I don't get it. I mean, I know your sister. Pass me the peach marmalade, please. <laughs> Damn, she's got the gall to say please right there. Keeps you busy, but I'm more concerned with your little disappearing axe. Disappearing axe? Yes, disappearing axe. I don't know what goes on in that little head of yours, but it's absolutely unacceptable to go on a lunch break and not come back. I told you. I know what you told me, but... I load two trays of cookies and shut the oven, wiping my hands on the apron. I'm not going to be mad, but I'd like to know what's going on with you. <laughs> what? <laughs> is, she, is she like our close friend and is just kind of giving us like a good natured bribbing or what? What's going on? Even when you're late, you don't call, you don't answer your phone, you're always tired, you show up later than usual. May has always been your sister, so I'm used to things coming up, but this is on a whole new level. It's not like you at all. So I've been thinking. Are you dating someone? A girlfriend, huh? Why do you think I'm dating someone? You've got all the signs. Such as? You zone it at work, and you leave as soon as your shift ends. I cross my arms calmly. So you're saying that any person who zones out and leaves work on time is secretly dating someone? Well, no, but... Maybe I'm zoning out because my sister is in her first year of high school, and she's been weirdly secretive lately. It's her second year, James. I think you've had time to get used to it. So I'm not allowed to feel concerned. Come on, have some sense of familial affection. Okay, fine. Let's pretend I actually buy the garbage you're dishing out. Still! And maybe I leave after work because I have other things to do. Since when have you had other things to do? Is having a hobby a crime now? Her expression unsure, she uncrosses her arms as she watches me scoop out a lump of cookie dough. Pass me the other rolling pin. Okay, fine, it's not a crime, I still feel like something's off. I mean, you seem exhausted, we don't even get to hang out like we used to, you're always broke when I try to invite you out. I've always been broke. More so than usual. I didn't know you paid attention so closely. I wonder what other kinds of attention you've been paying to me. Yeah. Implying that I suspect that she likes me is a low blow, even for me. But in this case, a necessary one. Hana falls silent, unsure if she wants to continue. After a long, uncomfortable moment, she sighs, deciding against pressing the matter further. Success. Okay, I get it. Maybe it's not a secret girlfriend, but one thing I do know is that you are definitely hiding something. Nice to know you're just going to think what you want anyway. Thanks for the permission. Don't you mean... Persimmons? Persimmons? Oh no, the apple and the persimmon tartatine! Grabbing the oven mitts, she turns toward the oven. I finish putting the last of the desserts into the display case as Hana flips the open sign. I can't believe I won't see this place for the next two months. Well, that's what you get for deciding to be all fancy and going away on an island vacation. I don't think a mandatory family vacation is all that fancy. Dad and my step, uh, are going to disappear anyway, so it'll just be me, Moira, and the triplets, all annoying me at the same time. Yeah, she seems like a girl who's also surrounded all the time a lot by other girls. Hana smiles, then frowns, shooting me a glare. Please tell me that there'll still be a shop when I come back. I stand straighter, saluting her. Scout's honor. Sarcasm isn't honorable. Is that so? James! Yeah, yeah, I get it. Less sarcasm, more... Honorableness. She hands me the key. Okay, don't forget where the spare is. And heads up, Mom told me she'll be calling in to check on you every once in a while. She's still in Paris doing her training, and I'd like to keep it that way. If anything, and I mean anything happens to this shop, short of a nine kicking the door down and setting everything on fire, I'll have your skin. Somehow... I managed to keep a straight face. Listen, Hana, the shop isn't going to burn down just because you leave for a little while. Hana is annoying, but I get her concern. Since Noya came into my life, the shop has gone through some bizarre instances, all of which I've had to painstakingly cover to the best of my ability. <gasps> okay, so real quick here, uh, before I end the part, I just want to say that I really dig this Let's Play, and the people who made it, and I think, uh, I would hope that uh, there's a sequel um, also, uh, 
speaking of Let's Plays in recent years that I think are actually really cool, um, there's this other one called Fall Streak. Love to do a playthrough on that. That would be a lot of fun. But we're playing pairs for now, and I love pairs. And I also love pairs in real life. Um, pretty good for like some good uh, juice and smoothies. Regardless, I'm so glad I get to play this right now. And stay tuned. Stay tuned. I love it. People who make this game. Sequel! Pretty please. And hey man, hey man, hey man, hey man. Thanks for checking out. Pears is the visual novel. Zombies. Do you like pears? I like pears. Thank I you. eat pears. It's a Thank fruit. You. It goes in a smoothie. And